guys might think this is exciting. All right, so uh, the cover of your book does not look like this. I mean, it might if you didn't buy the right edition. Uh, but uh, the cover of your book probably looks like something else. It has a gorilla face on it, right? There you go, Chandler. Draw a gorilla face. You're already making notes. All right, so you need to provide a little background, right? on what is evolution, what do we mean by evolutionary psychology, how did we get there coming from sort of different disciplines, right? How are we blending these two things together, uh, and, uh, and so forth, right? So what we're gonna do is sort of briefly go over some things. A lot of what we're gonna do today is going to be the, hey, this is cool, or we're gonna talk about that later. Uh, because today's really sort of an introduction to some concepts, right? and we're gonna dig into some of those concepts later. A lot of this is sort of getting you to think about things differently, sort of reframing the way that you think about uh, development and behavior and, and other such fun things, right? And getting you to sort of sort of move into that uh, mindset and introduce you to some really interesting folks, right? So evolution before Darwin, right? How many of you heard of that guy, Charles Darwin? One of you? Yeah, he, he did some stuff, right? <clears throat> that was pretty cool, we'll talk about that. But there were actually some folks before Darwin who had some ideas about how species develop, right? And while those ideas were not exactly right, uh, there's some interesting things we can think about and some value we can take from those, right? So when we talk about evolution, what do we mean? We simply, I mean, it's a very, very simple concept. It's a very simple definition. Um, but at the same time, it's a very complicated thing to get your head around. And Josh will talk about a few of those reasons later why that is. Um, it's not a, a limitation of you individually. It's sort of a species limitation. So don't, don't be too harsh on yourself about it, right? So you know, cut yourself a little slack. But all we mean is it's change. And uh, typically, we're talking about organic structure over time. Now, we're talking in this class about behavior, right? So you might think, well, you know, What's the relationship between organic structure and behavior? Uh, Laura, you could tell them that relationship, right? It's called physiological psychology. This class you take on Thursdays. Get back to you in a couple weeks. Get back to you in a couple yeah. weeks, right? Some of you have taken that class, right? So very much uh, this organic, physical, biological structure is going to be related to behavior, right? Uh, why do we do things that are different than what lizards do? You know, our behaviors are different, right? And our behaviors are different because we have some different biological structures, okay? Uh, lizards have tails. That's fun, right? Do you see the robot? This is a little side note. Do you see that robotic tail that some folks developed? To, well, that was impressive. It was like this, it was like a segmented tail. It was like this long. You didn't see the video clips of this? Yeah, so it was like modeled after a seahorse tail. Exciting. And it gives people balance, right? So like, what, what's, what's a tail good for? Um, it's good for like grabbing onto things and keeping you balanced if you're jumping from one place to another, right? And as um, like ground dwelling species, which we are, uh, we don't really need to have good balance as we're jumping from one thing to another, right? Like limb to limb. And we don't grab onto things too much, except like, uh, you know, Starbucks coffee cups and iPhones, right? That's all we need to grab onto these days. So having a tail is not terribly helpful to us, right, Chandler? But uh, these folks developed this tail and then they, people would jump and then they would like jump while they're carrying heavy things and the tail would automatically sort of rebalance them. Oh, that's kind of cool. It actually was pretty cool, right? So if you ever wish you had a tail, there you go. You can buy one now. You can, yeah, I, I think so, right? There you go. Uh, so anyway, and this is, this is over time, right? And what we mean by over time is not like over time, like over the course of the next 16 weeks, you guys are gonna learn some stuff. Like that's not really time for evolution, right? Uh, and Josh, I think you're gonna talk about deep time and some other concepts later. So this time, uh, for right now, just realize this is an incredibly long amount of time that you probably cannot fathom, okay? Like the choice of the word fathom and deep right there. I mean, that was so nice. How many of you have heard of Lamarck? Okay, one person, great. So Lamarck had this idea about evolution, and he was kind of sitting around and thinking about giraffes one day, which you know a lot of folks do, right? He's like, huh, what are we gonna, look at these giraffes, they have really long necks, how'd they get those? I bet they stretched their necks, and then when they had little baby giraffes, 
the ones who stretched farther had longer neck baby giraffes, right? And so over time, you can imagine how you get these longer and longer necks on giraffes. Um, it doesn't really work that way, okay? Uh, Lamarck thought, uh, you know, the cells secrete some magic juice that makes their necks longer. Uh, we're going to call it magic juice because he had no idea what he was, what he was thinking about. The, a lot of people write off Lamarck pretty quickly, right? It's like, well, that's a ridiculous idea. And on some level it is. But uh, he did have some interesting ideas. One, that these, uh, these traits are inherited, right? He's one of the first folks to kind of think about that uh, in, in an interesting way. Secondly, uh, and again, I, I promised JP we would mention this briefly, uh, epigenetics, right? I don't know if you guys are familiar much with epigenetics. And I read an interesting essay a few years ago comparing Lamarckism to epigenetics, right? So epigenetics is basically your behaviors now affect the way and the structure of the DNA that's passed off to your offspring, right? Uh, and which is kind of, Mary, pretty interesting, right? And that's really, in, in some sort of crude form, what Lamarck was saying, right? You're doing some behavior and that's changing what you're going to pass off to your offspring. And so while I would never say that Lamarck was right or that Lamarck was in any way sort of, uh, uh, you know, proceeding or, or thinking about uh, epigenetics, he, he did have some interesting ideas that weren't exactly wrong either. So uh, he's kind of one of the big guys. Once we move on from uh, Lamarck, we end up with this guy, Charles Darwin. I like to call him Chuck D. Uh, Everybody should have a cool nickname, right? And I think he was the original Chuck D. Some other people have tried to grab that moniker since then. But, you know, when you're doing some awesome work in the 1800s, you, you get a, whatever nickname you want, right? Darwin, uh, yeah, I, I mean, even though there were other folks, and, and we should mention Wallace briefly, right, just because we got to give a guy his due. Uh, Darwin had his ideas about natural selection uh, a, a good couple decades before he actually published it. And how many of you are aware that evolution can be controversial when folks talk about it, right? Right? Not everybody's like, man, that's awesome, just like buying shoes. It's just like a regular thing, even though it should be. Uh, so you can imagine a couple hundred years ago it even being more controversial, right? And uh, more likely to be met with skepticism and uh, downright hostility, right? Uh, so he kind of was, was sitting on this idea for, for a couple decades. Largely, he was, he was married to a very... Uh, devout cousin, uh, didn't know he was married to his cousin. Uh, I think, I guess, I mean, they had offspring, so I guess they weren't close enough to worry about. Um, so, see, Mary, you're learning interesting things. Yes. Yeah. Uh, his his wife was very devout, and he was kind of worried about how she would take the sort of um, you know implications of his of his work. What do we mean by natural selection? Basically, it's, it's pretty simple, right? There's a certain set of traits that are going to be more likely to lead to your survival. It's that simple, right? And if you survive long enough to reproduce, the traits you have are going to be more likely to pop up in following generations than the traits of individuals who did not survive long enough to reproduce, right? And, and that, that just makes, it makes common sense, right? I mean, it's not a real complicated uh, thing to think about. Now, Darwin got this idea, uh, there are a couple sources actually that kind of led Darwin to think about this. One actually was geology. But, uh, prior to, to Darwin, we were aware uh, that different geological strata contained different species, right? Which, which is kind of, an, you should automatically sort of think like, hey, if there are different species, then we should probably have things going on to get to those different species, right? And there were even folks who had <clears throat> ideas about uh, catastrophism, right? So this idea that there's these big catastrophes that come along, <clears throat> wipe out a bunch of species, and then there are new species that come about after that, right? And that was an idea before Darwin uh, formulated his theories, or his uh, sort of had two theories. We don't always think about it as two separate theories, but we sort of had two separate theories. So that idea was, was floating around as well, right? And that idea is also not exactly right, but it's not exactly wrong either, right? There are definitely instances, and we could probably find one 65 million years ago or so, 
uh, that was a rather catastrophic event, right, that kind of wiped out a bunch of one kind of species and then brought up other species, right? That's why there are far more rats today than there are uh, Tyrannosaurus rexus, right? Uh, in case you've ever wondered why that's the case. Uh, so that big, like, bam, thing that kind of hit down in Mexico, uh, at least that's the you know, prevailing idea right now based on our evidence, wiped out all those large reptilian species, right? Uh, and then what survived were these little, you know, dirty mammals that uh, could, could tolerate the change in the climate. And so catastrophism is, is again, not, not wrong. It may or may not be the major guiding force or the major, uh, the major concept that, change, that causes change in species, right? Darwin was also aware, apparently, I don't know, uh, folks in England back in the 1800s had some weird hobbies. And one of those hobbies was breeding pigeons. They're, I know, right? It's almost as weird as like breeding dogs, uh, which, which is also very weird. These people buy these useless dogs, right? Like I understand when you wanted like a big dog to pull something, but now they want these like little dogs with funny ears, right? Uh, and we don't think about how weird that is, but it's really weird. Uh, and it's as weird as creating pigeons that when they fly, they look like they're falling. And so there were, uh, <laughs> in England, they're, they're like tumbling pigeons. And so they would breed these pigeons, right, and, and, and they would make different kinds of birds. And different birds, they were still basically the same species, right, but they just had different characteristics, right? And so they had different traits. And so we call that artificial selection, right? Uh, how many of you have a poodle? Nobody has a poodle. You have a poodle? I have a multi poodle. Yeah, it's even worse. That's, that's even worse. <laughs> but, but the point is, how did you get that, right? And the point is, you someone thought, hey, you know what would be great? A dog with these characteristics. And so what you do is you kind of shop around. You're like, well, this dog's got some of those characteristics, and this dog's got the others, um, and they've got parts that fit together. So let's put them in a cage for a while and see if we can get six or eight uh, offspring that, that have what we want. And then of those six or eight offspring, you go, well, like half of them got the got the bad set of traits, and the other half got the good set, right? And then let's take those and kind of breed them together for a little bit and see what happens, right? And then over time, you end up with a... A multi-poop. A multi-poop, multi multi <laughs> yeah. I rescued her. They're very cute things. I rescued They're very cute things. They are. They are. I'll take your word on it. I'll bring her uh, inside. Yeah. She's smelling. I can't say. Actually... How many cats do you have again? I, we have three cats right now. Uh, but that none of those were mine. I, I mean, like, like none of them. Like none of those were because of me. I had a cat. That one was mine, and I, he died. Not my fault. He was like 20 years old. So reasonable thing for a cat to do after two decades is die. It's a positive story, wasn't it? Yeah. I had that cat half my life. So, yeah, anyway, artificial selection, right? So they select for these traits. You end up with different, uh, different uh, manifestations of traits, right? So you get these different kinds of dogs, different kinds of horses, different kinds of birds, right? Uh, different kinds of cows, whatever, right? And people do this and have done this for a long time, right? Uh, folks have done it with not just uh, animals, but plants, right? How do you think we got corn? There was some version of corn that wasn't so awesome, right? Didn't really produce as many corn kernels, right? And so it was a lot more work to get the grain from that. And then somebody was like, man, this is too much work. You know what would be better? What if I just took two of these plants that were, like, you know, giving me a lot of kernels, and if I just rub them together a little bit, because that's how plants have sex, just rub them together a little bit, and then let's see what happens, right? And that's, that's how we got awesome corn. That's now causing us a lot of dietary problems. But that, that's a whole separate issue, right? So, Traits, they vary. You get a set of traits that make it more likely for you to live. You're going to be more likely to send those traits on to the next generation, right? Now, that sounds very simple and very easy. There's a ton of nuance there, right? And we'll kind of talk about some of that nuance now. We'll talk about some of the nuance later as we go through, right? So a few things you want to think about here is variation. Traits vary, right? You can look around uh, in this classroom, for example, and you can see that the traits vary, right? You can pick a, a very innocuous trait, uh, hair color. How many of you have a different hair color than someone else? 
the answer is every, yeah, great job, Paul, everybody, right? Everybody's hair color is, is, is different in some way, right? Um, and, and let's think about like natural hair color, right? I'm gonna assume some of you have uh, artificial hair color, right? And that happens, um, which is fine. But there's variation there, right? And that variation can be passed on, right, to, to subsequent generations. Uh, if you guys think about your families, right, your, your biological families, how many of you have a hair color more similar, you would say, to folks who you're genetically related to than folks you're not genetically related to, right? That's the case, right? That's, that's how that works, okay? Um, so you have that variation that comes through inheritance, right? Now, hair color, for our purposes, we're going to assume hair color has nothing to do with your survival success. Um, I don't think it does. It may have at some point, right? Uh, people with a certain color of hair that, you know, could have been ostracized. I don't know. I'm making up a story here, Josh. Uh, but let's assume hair color doesn't have anything to do with survival. But there are things that, that are related to survival, right? Uh, is there variation in cardiovascular function? Absolutely, right? Is that inherited? Absolutely, right? How many of you, you don't have to raise your hand because I'm going to ask you some personally, you know, personal medical information. How many of you have someone in your family who has high cholesterol, high blood pressure, right? And how many of you are concerned about that now and might even be doing something to mitigate that because you know it's an issue, right? Okay. That's why I try to, like, avoid students. I, high blood pressure runs in my family. So I just stay away from it as much as I can. Now, uh, something with cardiovascular function, that variability, that variance, certain traits can lead to survival, right? If you got a really, really bad set of genes for cardiovascular function, that's going to uh, reduce the likelihood you'll survive, right? And so, so this is nice. Even if you've got a bad set of genes, they're not as bad as they could have been, or your ancestors would have been dead. So there you go, right? So that's that's something to take. You know, you think next time you're like, man. I got my ugly grandma's feet. Uh, and you think, well, not as ugly as they could have been, because that person probably had feet so ugly they didn't survive. And then, uh, I don't know if that's true. Think about the positives, right? Put a positive spin on it. Questions about that? No? Okay, so that's natural selection. Then there's this idea of sexual selection, which is, is sort of different, but sort of the same, right? And we often sort of think about this we often don't think about sexual selection, maybe, and maybe we should. I think we should think about it a bit more. So with sexual selection, here's the idea that, again, we have these inherited trait variations. That's not surprising, right, Chris? I mean, we got it. Okay. Uh, but some of those will make you more successful at mating than others, right? Not necessarily is this related to your survival. It sort of is because you have to survive long enough to become sexually mature, right? But once you reach that point, uh, what's the likelihood that you're going to, uh, to, to, to mate and, and have more offspring, right? And there are a set of traits that'll uh, make that happen, right? And so what's really interesting about sexual selection is, is it runs, seemingly, it runs often counter to natural selection, right? And this is one of the things, there's a sort of story about Darwin who used to vomit every time he saw a peacock. Uh, I, I don't know that he actually vomited, right? How many of you have ever seen a peacock? And how many of you know what a peahen is? Okay. Chandler, Chandler, you're not too confident on that. I just, people I know have peacocks for whatever reason, and they briefly explained it to me. So. Yeah, so the peahen is the female, right? And the peacock's the male. Uh, so there you go. It's, it's kind of like with any other bird. That's kind of the names. They just put pea in the front. Uh, so, uh, for those of you that have seen a peacock, what do they have? They've got those giant feathers, right? And what's the, huh? Plumage. Plumage, that's the word. Yeah, they've got plumage. That's what makes them look pleasing, right? They look pleasing to you. Now, how many of you, so let's think about, um, let's all imagine that we're peacock predators, okay? We're some sort of, uh, some sort of cat, right? Cat, right? A cat's going to eat a bird. That makes sense, right? So we're going to be a cat. Now, if you're a cat, which bird are you going to eat? The bird with the giant feathers that are sticking out that can't hide from you? Or that little itty bitty brown bird back there that you're not sure if it's a tree stump or a bird? You're going to go for the big flashy one, right? Because that's easy to, it's easy to grab, right? Okay? It's easy to see. It's, it, it can't hide, right? Peacocks can't hide, right? They can't do it. They try. 
Okay? So if you're thinking about this from a natural selection standpoint, you think, oh, that's the dumbest thing ever. Why would you put a giant flashing sign up, right, that says, hey, I'm a tasty bird? Okay? Does not make any sense at all from a natural, only looking at it from natural selection. If you think about it from sexual selection, however, then it starts to make a little more sense, right? Because if you're a peacock, what's the one thing you want to do? Peahens. So you want to be attracted to the peahens, right? And what's attracted to peahens is apparently giant plumage, okay? So no matter how long you live, right, you're going to live alone if you're a peacock without big feathers. So you've got big feathers, you attract the peahen, right? Now you've got to worry about trade-offs, right? So now we're thinking about well, how big can I get my feathers? What other traits do I need so that I don't get eaten? Because like big feathers are nice, but if I never get around to meeting the right peahen, my big feathers aren't going to make a difference, right? And so you've got to still have that natural selection process going on, which is really sort of interesting. Um, I think it's really interesting. Have you ever wondered why men have so much snot? Yeah, I'm going to tell you why men have snot. It's, be, it's because of sexual selection, right? So uh, typically, if we, and we'll talk a whole lot more about what's kind of prototypically attractive, right, for males and females. If you think about what's attractive for a male, uh, typically you're looking for uh, like V-shaped torsos, right? Uh, nice deep voices, good facial hair, right? If you meet a guy with a nice beard, he's got a very white voice, and he's got shoulders like Chris Hemsworth, you guys are doing all right, right? Wh whoever you are, okay? So, what gives you those traits is high levels of testosterone, right? The problem with high levels of testosterone is it turns down your immune system. So what are you gonna do instead? You make a bunch of snot, right? So you make a bunch of snot to catch invading particles and you can spit that stuff out, right? Because your immune system's not gonna work as proper, uh, properly as well as it should. Yeah. Chandler, you got it now, right? You should just try just try a little fake snot. You know, you can go get that at like magic shops or novelty stores. <laughs> Make yourself more attractive. So there you go, right? Nobody ever thought about that, right? Now, now you know. Now you know why men have more snot. It's probably also one of the reasons they're a bit sweatier, because it helps kind of flush out whatever. Why are you making this face? That's, this? that's just my face. That's behind you. That was, why are you making this face? <laughs> Sweat and snot, not really attractive things to talk about, right? Um, but the next time you're complaining, like let's say you have a male partner, and the next time you're complaining about the amount of snot or sweat they have, you can, you can blame your parents and their parents and their parents on back, right? Because they continue to select for people who are males who have more snot and sweat. Yeah. So there you go. You can make a difference now by selecting people who have less snot to mate with and have offspring. No. The more you know. The more you know, right? I think that's called artificial selection at that point. All right, so sexual selection, that's important. The one thing the book doesn't talk about, and I wish it did, was runaway sexual selection. I wish it had just a, just a moment of runaway sexual selection for you, because that's kind of an interesting thing to think about. Uh, in particular, there's uh, uh, these, uh, these bugs that have eye stalks, right? So they have heads, and then coming out from the side of their heads, they have these stalks that have eyes at the end. It's, they're called eye stalks, right? That kind of makes sense. So uh, what is apparently really attractive to the female of this species is big eye stalks, right? So some people are looking for broad shoulders, they're looking for broad eye stalks, right? So they have the, I know, right, Tiffany, you're thinking like eye stalks, right? So what happens? Over time, as the females continue to select and mate with males that have bigger eye stalks, uh, the eye stalks continue to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, right? And there's a certain point where you can imagine really large eye stalks becomes a problem, right? Like navigating through your environment. So imagine you have like 10 foot poles coming out of the side of your head and you're like trying to walk through the world. It becomes a very, it becomes a difficult thing to do. And then you stop surviving, right? And so the individuals with very, very large eye stalks start dying, right? Because that's become, that sexual selection, right? Has, has that trait has moved to the point where it's interfering with natural selection now, right? So yes, you're really attractive, but you're gonna die before you meet any females. 
so you're not going to reproduce, right? You see, see the trade-off there, right? And so runaway sexual selection can push a trait too far, and then it's going to have to come back, right? So sometimes there are traits that will oscillate over time, and they can see that with these, um, with these eye stalks. The, the reason people will use insects often to study, um, to study evolution is because they, they reproduce quickly. You can have multiple generations in a very short time span. How many of you have ever seen like, uh, you know, Drosophila research, right, like fruit flies? Yeah, why? You can have like a bazillion fruit fly generations in six weeks, right? How long does it take to get like three human generations? It's like 100 years, right? Uh, and so you're not going to be able to like test things out over that time frame, but you can do it with insects so often. What we know about evolution comes from insects. So there you go. There's kind of the competing interests of natural selection and sexual selection, right? They're kind of kind of working together. You have to have both, right? Not only do you need to live, but you also have to be attractive to the opposite sex of your species, right? Does that make sense? And I guess it, we should talk about something here as well. Yeah, we should do this now. Uh, there are a couple sort of sets of competition with sexual selection. One is going to be between members of the same sex, right? So this is sort of that stereotypical, like, you know, two deer fighting each other, right? Whatever, whoever wins gets to mate with the herd. Uh, then there's also uh, mate choice, right? So that's when someone from the opposite sex is selecting, right? And so typically, uh, sort of traditionally at least, the, the phrase here has been female choice, right? Uh, which on some level carries some, and that's what Darwin referred to it as, was, was female choice, carries some sexism of the day, right? But there's some interesting sort of things that we should actually think about here that are biologically based, right? Uh, in most species, there is uh, one sex that contributes more metabolically to the production of offspring than the other sex, right? And if you're going to put more effort in than someone else, you're going to be more selective about who that other individual is, right? Uh, and it doesn't really matter whether that's males or females. For, for the most part, uh, and for our purposes, mostly what we'll be thinking about, because we're going to primarily focus on mammals, uh, we're going to be thinking about females being the choosier uh, of the two sexes. And the reason for that, you guys know where babies come from, right? And you know how long it takes babies to come from there, right? Uh, it takes like nine months, right? And so if you're going to actually be the individual sort of housing, right, that developing uh, offspring, if you're going to be the one consuming more calories for that, and for mammals, there's actually some obligatory period after the birth of that uh, offspring where you have to, to provide food for that, right? Uh, that's going to be food that comes from your body. Then you would imagine thinking a little bit more and being a bit more selective about your uh, mating choices, right? Then someone who doesn't have to be, I'm not saying they aren't, but just biologically they're not obliged to uh, invest any more resources in that than just a few moments. Does that make sense? So I make sure that I'm sunk in there. Right? That's not an excuse for uh, you know like skipping out on your parental duties just because it's not growing inside of you, uh, right? Okay, so I don't want to justify that. But biologically speaking, you're not required to do anything beyond sort of that initial uh, few moments. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? And again, typically that's going to be what we would call the female of the sex, right? Um, there are some examples uh, where the males are choosier in certain species because they're the ones who are going to invest more time in the uh, growth and development of the offspring. So they're going to be the choosier uh, sex in that instance. There's some, uh, some frog species, some cockroaches, seahorses. We already talked about seahorses and their magic robotic tails. Uh, seahorses are in that group as well. But for mammals, uh, because of lactation uh, and you know, sort of internal gestation, we're uh, thinking females typically are going to be sec uh, uh, more choosy with their sexual um, partners uh, and their mating choices. And we'll talk a whole lot about that. We've got a whole like, set of chapters about how we can figure out if that's true with humans or not. Here's a spoiler alert. It typically is. I know that's a shocker, right? All right.
I, I mean, it's a shocker that, you know, that the, the data would line up with, with something that, that makes that much logical sense, right, when you think about it from that evolutionary perspective. All right, well, should we talk about genetic drift? I think we probably should. So you've got natural selection, you've got sexual selection, but there are also some other things that can happen that can change uh, the, the genetic makeup of a population. These are typically random, right? They're not, they're, there's maybe a couple arguments you could make that say, well, some of them might be related to, uh, to some selection process, but, but typically we're gonna think about them being, um, being just random, right? Some of those are gonna just be mutations, just random mutations that may or may not have any effect on survival. Hair color, great example, right? Uh, not something that's going to contribute to survival. There's a set of genes that, you know, control your hair color. You could get some random variations and then all of a sudden you're like, whoa, we don't have that color of hair anymore. We got a new one. And, and then you have that. There are also founder effects, which is kind of interesting. So if you take a, a small random sample of the population and you take those and, and, and move them somewhere else, right? Assuming the traits that, that we're thinking about are not related to survival again, that new colony is going to have um, have a higher proportion of that uh, that trait than you would anticipate elsewhere. I think the example in the book they use red hair, right? If you took uh, a number of folks who have red hair and then move them to some new island and let them reproduce, more of their offspring are going to have red hair than what you would find in the, the normal population because you founded that population with a higher proportion of red hair. Again. It's really got to be something that doesn't have an effect on survival, right? Because if it's a, it, if that trait is detrimental to survival, then you're gonna you're gonna work your way back to that kind of that natural set point, right? That baseline. Uh, and finally, we end up with uh, genetic bottlenecks. Okay, we have to be careful about when we think about genetic bottlenecks as well, because this again is going to be related to uh, typically a, a catastrophe, and the survivors of that are not going to be. Um, again, genetically representative of the entire population, right? This does not mean that there's some, uh, so let's imagine there's a situation, uh, which happened in the history of our species, where a particular strain of grass went, uh, went extinct because of, of shifts in the climate, right? And those individuals with a genetic mutation who were able to survive that sort of famine situation and eat a different kind of grass or a different kind of grain you know, that's related to some trait with survival. Uh, a genetic bottleneck has to be something random, right? Let's imagine that red hair example again, and let's imagine that a, uh, you know, a giant meteor hits Huntington, West Virginia. Uh, we'll see if we can figure out, you know, how that's gonna look differently the following day. Let's see if you can notice. There we go, Marion. Great job. You're not gonna know in some places, are you? It's gonna look the same. You're like, well, I'm not sure. <laughs> Uh, but let's imagine while that happened, there was a meeting for red-haired people um, in a safe bunker, right? And just like randomly, all of the red-haired, right? I mean, this is where you're going to go. Uh, you're going to go to this meeting uh, for red-haired folks, and then everybody else is going to get wiped out. You know, not everybody, but a number of people. And then all the red-haired people come back out, and they're like, hey, and then there's more red-haired people after. Not related to your survival, you were just randomly in a place where you weren't as affected by that catastrophe. Again, if it is a survival related issue, you're going you're gonna to work your way back, right? Because it's going to, if it's a trait related to survival, it's either going to make you better or worse at reproducing, and then you're going to increase or decrease that as things go forward. Caveats, we should think about this. One, evolution is not intentional. There is not an end goal to evolution as a whole, right? There's an end goal to what you're doing as an individual. Uh, that's surviving until you can reproduce, right? Now, I say that with the, uh, like, please don't have children. Right, because we don't need more people kind of statement. So uh, when, I, when I make these statements about reproducing and the point of existence being to live until you reproduce, that's not saying people who don't have kids are useless. In fact, you're some of my favorite people uh, if you don't have kids uh, because you're going to keep people off the roads that clog up you know, when I'm trying to get places. So we don't need more people. We need less people. So you know, work on that. If you do have offspring, just make sure they're good, productive citizens who will, if not pay into my social security, figure out how to fix it so I can have some retirements. <laughs>
all right, so evolution is not intentional. We are not headed toward a goal, right? And in fact, evolution is, it, we're not even thinking about the future. Like evolution is not a forward looking process. In fact, it's a response to the past. And this creates a real problem occasionally. Because what worked to solve the problems of yesterday might not be effective at solving today's or tomorrow's problems, okay? And that's something with, uh, how many of you have trouble with impulse control? Yeah. How many have trouble with attention, right? Yeah, right there you go, right? These are things that are not terribly helpful today. Again, they were very helpful in the past, you know, when there were threats coming from every direction and you had to kind of like be on the lookout constantly for that. But today, they're not as helpful, right? Today, it's really helpful to be able to like sit and look at a computer screen for hours on end, right? And that, that's, that's helpful. That was not helpful in our evolutionary past, so that's not a trait that survived, right? Those people who were like picking up rocks and just looking at them for hours, right? Guess what they didn't have time to do? Have your grandparents, right? They didn't have time to reproduce. They didn't have time to do the other things. The people who were like, hey, what's that? What's that? Oh, well, no, you know, there you go, right? So that short attention span proved helpful uh, over time, and that's why we have some difficulties with that now, right? How many of you catch yourself doing that? How many of you have Netflix? How many of you spend more time flipping through what's available to watch? I know, right? Than actually watching anything. Like, oh, that looks fun. Add to my list. Add to my list. Add to my list. This is how I figured out uh, my the list was capped at 500 on the device I was using. Jesus. I know, right? Because there was like so much that I found interesting. I was like, oh, I definitely want to watch that. And then I realized like I'm never going to have time to watch that. But it's still on my list because I don't even have time to go back and clean up my list. I just wait until that's no longer available on Netflix, and then my list goes down by like 10 or 20. Like, well, I don't get to watch that show anymore. Right? Yeah. In fact, I love Netflix because it's causing, uh, and I don't mean you individually, it's causing you as a generation uh, to have less sex. And not that I. I I necessarily want you to have less sex. I just want fewer of the products that come from that, right? Again, fewer people. So, so Netflix is really, it's, it's really great. Huh? It's population control. It's population control, yeah, yeah. There you go. Right? It's indirect birth control. Yeah. Maybe I should add it to my class. <laughs> it's just be a funny story. There you go. Uh, and evolution is gradual, right, Josh? You'll tell them about how gradual, right? So what I would like for you to do, Josh, is I want you to start now until the time when you're going to give your lecture. And I want you to move uh, at the pace of evolution uh, to get to me uh, by, by the end of, of, you know, in the next 20 minutes. All right. See how fast he's moving? That's exactly where he's going to be when we finish. Too. Like, that's, that's evolution's pace. Uh, should we think about the modern synthesis? Yeah, so so, are there problems with Darwin's ideas? Yeah, are there problems with any idea that, that was developed 200 years ago? Probably, right? Because guess what Darwin didn't have? He didn't have DNA evidence. He didn't know DNA existed, which is the biggest complaint anybody's ever had about Darwin's theories. It was like, yeah, but what about how they get the inheritance? And Darwin was like, oh, things just blend together, and there you go. And while that was wrong, and somebody knew better at that time. His name was Gregor Mendel, right? Pea plants. Huh? Pea plants. See, so going back to peas. Uh, in fact, actually, Gregor Mendel, this is probably, I think Darwin made two big mistakes in his life. The first was not publishing uh, Origin of Species when he first had the idea, because that set us back, not, not just the 20 years he waited, but, you know, by the time you, you multiply that out uh, and sort of the exponential progress that we've had since then, it probably set us back 100 years in terms of evolutionary thinking, right? And so I think that was his first big mistake. Uh, you, were, you thought I was gonna say marrying his cousin, right? Uh, his second big mistake was not reading Gregor Mendel's papers when Gregor Mendel sent them to him, right? Like not reading his papers because he didn't have access to PubMed um, is, is fine, right? I'm like, oh, okay, well, he didn't know this guy in Austria even existed. But the problem is he did. And he didn't bother to read or didn't grasp the, the, the sort of power of what Gregor Mendel was saying, right? And there have been a couple problems, I mean, there have been people who've, I don't want to say attacked Gregor Mendel. There have been some people who've said Mendel cooked his data, and he did because he loved pea soup. Uh, but 
there are people who've said that he has that like his data is too perfect, right? Like the outcome of his two, of his 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 results, it's too perfect to have actually happened. Uh, but there have been a number of people who've gone back and said, no, that's exactly how it works. So don't worry too much about it. Just know Gregor Mendel was this idea, uh, this guy who had these great ideas, did some awesome work. Was really thinking about uh, what we call like particulate inheritance, right? Which means you you get uh, some gene from one parent and some gene from another. They don't blend and mix. One of those is going to be expressed or not, right? And so you kind of have that. And that's how you can have, did we talk about two brown-eyed people having a blue-eyed baby in this class? No, not yet. Okay, that can happen. And the reason that can happen is uh, because of particulate inheritance. If it was blending, right, if it was blending, uh, and both of your parents were brown-eyed, then you could only be some combination of the blending of their brown eyes, right? Uh, but because of particulate inheritance where you can get, you guys know the big bees and the little bees, right? With, right? And so if both of your parents have a big bee and a little bee, then they can, you know, sort of randomly 25% of the time give you two little bees and then you have blue eyes, okay? So if you have blue eyes and your parents both have brown eyes, don't worry. I mean, there's some chance that, you know, they're not your parents, but that's a whole separate conversation we could have. Uh, however, uh, two blue-eyed folks cannot have brown-eyed offspring. So if both your parents have blue eyes and you have brown eyes, I'd start digging into that one. I'd start digging into that one. Yeah, it doesn't work that way. Uh, and for our purposes, like green eyes and hazel eyes, those are blue eyes. So don't get too worked up about that. I don't know if anybody falls into that category. No one. Also, I should mention, Eye color is a little more complicated than that, but you don't need to know that. So don't worry about it. All right, hey, there's Gregor Mendel. How about that? Uh, did all these pea plants, kind of came up with this idea of genes. That was pretty awesome. Uh, the problem with Gregor Mendel is not only did Darwin go like, scoff, that's nothing, uh, like the rest of the world did too, for a long time. And it was a while before anybody else picked back up and said, hey, you know what's pretty cool? This Gregor Mendel guy. Uh, he really had it with this DNA business. You know, you guys have heard of Punnett Squares and all these other things. It's sort of, uh, uh, there's a bit of a revival back in the 30s and 40s. We call this the modern synthesis, where they were taking DNA information and trying to blend that and put that together with uh, Darwin's theories and really create a nice, cohesive uh, sort of theory. Now, had Again, Darwin pre published his data when he had it. The modern synthesis might have occurred around the turn of the 19th century, or the 20th century. Mm -hmm. I don't know, which one's the turn? Because one's turned into the other. I've never understood that. Like, like is it the one you're turning into? Yeah. Okay. So let's say it would have happened in the, uh, around the early 1900s, uh, and then maybe some guys like E.O. Wilson, when he came around and said, hey, you know what's awesome? All this stuff. He might have had a little more data to back up what he was saying. Should we talk about Conrad Lawrence? We should, as much as I really don't want to. Um, so here's the real caveat about Conrad Lawrence. He was a Nazi sympathizer. So let's put a, like a, a minus there for him, right? So we want to keep that in mind. Uh, did he have some interesting ideas? He did. The biggest thing we want to think about here is imprinting, right? Why, why is imprinting a thing? Well, look at all these fun ducks just following him. Isn't that exciting? And that's what he would do. He would just walk around his farm and ducks followed him. And, and this story. Now, why is that important? Well, these are some of the, Conrad Lawrence and Nico Tinbergen are some of the first folks to actually start thinking about the study of behavior and the study of behavior in a way, we'll go back, the study of behavior, well, yeah, I'm sorry, we'll stop here. The study of behavior in a way that allowed you to think about the value of those behavioral adaptations, right? And now we're, now we're starting to get into uh, not just evolution, but sort of evolutionary psychology, because we're starting to think about behavior and, and things. And actually, Lawrence, Conrad Lawrence was one of the first guys to talk about the evolution of cognitive domains and cognitive concepts and thoughts and 
things like that. So it's kind of important to mention him. Uh, Nico Timbergen, he did a, a lot of work with uh, stickleback fish. I don't know if anybody's interested in stickleback fish. Uh, they're fish that have some interesting behaviors. We'll talk about them at some point. But he had sort of four questions that he would want to ask. What's the like immediate influence on the behavior? What's the developmental influence? What's the value or function or purpose of that? And then what's the evolutionary origin of that behavior? Right? And so we kind of had these, these four questions. They would all have different answers. But when you ask all four of these, you get a very rich, complex answer and understanding about a particular behavior. Right? And so we kind of had this, uh, this ethology. Josh, I'm trying to, I know that's great. It's great. Look at that guy, Trivers, Robert Trivers, I mean, uh, pioneer in hairstyles. All right, I'd like to get a few more slides. I, Josh, I'm going to stop here at misunderstandings of evolution today. So keep moving your chair closer and closer as we, because we're, we're getting there. Uh, so we kind of have this study of behavior. In the 60s, there were some guys, 60s and 70s, there were a few guys who came along and they started taking uh, some of these concepts and, and converting them into math. I mean, how many of you love math? Nobody loves math. Nobody's going to raise their hand on that. Oh, well, there we go. Thank you for the enthusiasm about math. So what's really great is, uh, is, is these concepts and theories, right? But how are we going to quantitatively measure that? How are we going to decide? you know, yes, this is that much more influential or less influential, right? And we have to kind of quantify this in some way, because that's what we do in science, right? We, we quantify things. And uh, Hamilton was one of the first guys to think about some of this stuff uh, and get us on the path of doing math with this, right? And one of his ideas was inclusive fitness. Traditionally, uh, fitness had been measured in what we call now call classical fitness, right? And so it was very easy to measure. How many offspring do you have? And how does that compare to your peer group, the average in your population, right? And were you better or worse at reproducing, okay? So let's, let's imagine your, uh, what's your favorite species? Anybody got one another humans they want to toss out? Manatees. Manatees, there you go, right? I don't know why, it's a little strange, but uh, we'll go with manatees. So you got these manatees, right, Brandon? And let's say, I don't know, manatees are kind of slow breeding. But let's say they have, uh, as, as a manatee, I go, hey, how many offspring did you create? You're like eight. I created eight manatees during my lifetime. Like that's pretty impressive for a manatee, right? Uh, this is why manatees are, are in short supply these days. They don't, they don't procreate fast enough. And then I go over and I ask somebody else, I'm like, well, how many manatees did you make? And they're like, four. And I'm like, well, you're only half as good as this guy at making manatees, right? And so very easy to compare your fitness, right? Who made more manatees? That's easy, right? The problem is that that doesn't take into account, did you help your brothers or your sisters make manatees, right? And, and that might sound very weird uh, for a moment. Uh, but let's, let's think about uh, sort of support after the initial making of that manatee, right? Did you help those manatees survive, okay? And why is that important? Well, how many of you know you have DNA? How many of you have uh, parents? Yeah. Okay. And you and any one of your parents share 50% of DNA, right? That's how this works. Okay. Anybody have a biological sibling that you both share the same parents? Okay. Yeah, I, I got one of those. Anybody need a sister? <laughs> got an extra one I'm trying to get rid of. Um, what am I use for now? No. All right. So uh, my sister and I, we share about 50%. DNA on average, right? If you have a full biological sibling, you share about 50%. Uh, so let's imagine, Brandon, you made eight manatees. That's pretty awesome, right? Uh, but let's say you, you didn't help your siblings any, right? And we go over and we ask Paul, Paul, how many manatees did you make? Paul's like, I made four. Uh, but let's say Paul has uh, three siblings, and Paul helped all of those three siblings each uh, make, you know, six manatees. Right? And then you start thinking like, oh man, that's like a lot of manatees. How do I calculate like how much extra manatiness did he make, right? Uh, and so you can do this by calculating genetic relatedness, right? And adding that up over the number of individuals that you can help uh, to get uh, increased their reproductive success, right? And so if you think about you and your offspring, that's gonna be 
if you think you and uh, how many of you have nieces or nephews? Anybody have one of those? Chandler, you got one or both or uh, both? Okay, great job. Uh, so let's say so your nephew or a niece. I don't know which it is. Let's go with nephew. Like, what's the genetic relatedness between you and your nephew, right? So your sibling, 50 percent, and then half of their DNA went down to your your nephew. So it's like 25 percent, right? So if you do the math on that, and let's say you help that nephew grow up and, and have a you know nice productive life, right? Because you're going to be an awesome uncle. I can tell that. Uh, then you you get a little bonus for that, right? Maybe you didn't have any offspring of your own. You do have some offspring of your own, but you got to add that the weight of that nephew that you helped as well, right? And so you want to start thinking about that inclusive fitness, right? Not just the direct offspring you have, but what kind of effects do you have? right on the survival of your genetic relatives okay and when we look at that more complex picture it it not only gives us a better understanding of how uh, how genes can can move but it, it it makes us understand what we call the genes eye view right and instead of thinking about just an individual we start to think about the little particulate pieces of the individual those genes right and not only is it important for you to like make an offspring yourself, but it's more important to get your genes into the next generation, right? And so if you could convince your genetic relatives to have all of the offspring and to take care of all of them and to clean up after them and to change their diapers, right? And these are all things you don't have to do, but you can help them, right, Christy? You can provide them some support. Then you can get some, uh, some fitness bonus for that, right? Does that make sense? Well, it's a little broader picture. And, and you can actually do the math on this. I wish I remembered the, the sort of specifics of the of the joke, but it was something like um, Hamilton said he would rather save like four of his nephews than one of his siblings. Uh, it, was, it was something like that. And, and if you think about like like why would I want to do that, right? Well, one of your siblings is only fifty percent. Four of your nephews is twenty five percent each, right? So that's like a, that's like a hundred percent. So you get a lot, of, a lot more DNA going. There. Uh, you could also take a look at this. this. This predicts which relative you would help. Let's imagine you're in a situation where you have to save a relative. You have to save a stranger. You have to save you know, a close or distant relative. You're going to be more likely to save that closer relative, right? Uh, other classes will tell you there's some other reason why you're doing that, right? They'll, uh, you guys talk about that in other classes, probably social psychology, saving relatives. Is that true? Yeah, they'll give you some wrong explanation. The real explanation is it's all about how much DNA you share with that person and how likely that person is to, to send your DNA to the next, right? Because let's think about your nephew. I'm going to make you choose. Your nephew or your grandma? It's always going to be your nephew. From it's always going to be the nephew, right? Why would you save your grandma? She can't have any babies. <laughs> Paul, I like you better. He's going to die anyway. Yeah, I mean, your nephew's like what? 12, 13, 14? I don't know how old your nephew is. 12. He's 12. Yeah. Yeah, you're going to go save your nephew, right? Why? He can, have, he can pass your DNA to the next generation. Your grandma's already done what she's going to do. You know, just go get her a recipe for cookies. Should I tell you my grandparents are all dead? But I do have a nephew who's still alive. Nice. <laughs> of course I do. What if I argue that I can have more nephews if I convince my siblings to have more children? Yeah, I, I mean, you can absolutely do that. Um, but so if, if one of your siblings was in there, you know, let's say you have to save a sibling or a, ne a nephew. Right, like, the same well, like, you know, like the same way, like, you know, if I had to save my mom or my kid, like, you know, the, the, from that point of view, I'd be saving my kid, but I can have more kids. You can. And so, that really brings up some interesting points because later we'll talk about some of these like we'll talk a whole lot in a whole lot more detail about kinship, uh, uh, about altruism with kinship. We'll talk about not even talking about kinship. We're talking just like strictly evolutionary point of view, here. like you know, like reproduction and no, that's what I mean because we'll talk about those relationships about parent offspring conflict, right? Uh, because then that brings up a really interesting point. I guess I should skip down to, to Trivers now, right? Since he already took us there. Uh, because this this graph basically shows you how related you are to individuals. But let's skip down to Trivers and we'll, we'll kind of stop there and then we'll switch over to Josh. Uh, but 
that idea brings up parental investment, right? Your parents uh, should want, you or you as a parent should want to invest a lot into your kids, right? Which makes a lot of sense. Uh, the problem is, how many of you ha have uh, a sibling and you think, oh, my sibling got more than I did, right? Or uh, maybe you're the sibling who gets more, right? And so parents are going to want to try to balance that uh, that out. There's going to be we're going to talk a whole lot about this uh, as we as we move on into some of the other chapters. But you're absolutely right. It brings up some interesting conflicts that we can mathematically quantify because of Hamilton and Williams and Trivers and, and these folks. Okay. Does that sound all right? All right. Well, Josh, let's take a break here. We don't get a real break, uh, or you guys don't. Josh. Just...